Hello and welcome to News Clip. Today in Talking Science and Tech, we are joined by Prabir Prakastha and we will be looking at the results of a recent study published in the uh, Journal of Archaeological Science on the, on the food habits of the people living in Indus Valley Civilization. And what this study has found is that the people in, the, uh, in ancient South Asia were consumed a wide variety of meats. And to talk more on this study, we have Prabir. So Prabir, can you tell us about the results, the larger results of this study? What we see is over a large area, which is the Harappan settlements from early, what is called the mature Harappan, then you have the urban centers which come up, and then the late Harappan, when you see decline of the urban uh, civilization over there, and you get dispersed rural settlements in the region. All of this uh, seemed to show that people ate meat in all over the area. Their culinary habit seems to have been similar. Of course, there must have been variations within this, but the kind of food they ate and the kind of cooking methods they used is roughly similar. And it is similar also between the rural areas and the urban areas. Even the modes of preparation seem to be largely similar. So that is an interesting uh, development because you would expect that there might be within this area large amount of regional variations as well but that is not there so this is something we have comment, uh, commented about the harappan civilization harappan settlements earlier that there was a very large um, kind of uh, uniformity across this area across the civilizations which we found from not only the seeds of course which is widely known but also from the fact that uh, the, the weights and measures were similar across a very large area. Now, and it wasn't one empire that, that we can see, but it seemed to be, there was a uniformity, a uniformity across this region. And as I said, in terms of ancient antiquity, and this is an old civilization, one of the oldest, that this uniformity would seem to show something held this uh, cultural space together. And it's argued that it could be perhaps not a centralized empire, but also a religious uh, identity of some kind, religious groups who uh, practiced a similar religion and therefore had some unity of civilizational practice. This is again a conjecture, we don't know. And as we know, the Harappan civilization has not uh, left us records which we can read. There are seals, but those, uh, since we don't have, we have not deciphered the language, so we really can't read them. And even if we could, we don't seem to find detailed accounts that we find in, say, Sumeria, Babylonia, Mesopotamian civilizations. So written records don't seem to be there of the civilization of a kind that we can read. Uh, maybe they did have it and they have not been preserved, whatever way it is. But cultural unity at least in terms of food, is widely visible. And it is visible from early, mature Harappa to late Harappa when the urban centers are not no longer functional. So that's an interesting uh, result that we can see. Uh, then we also see that the methods of cooking, the kinds of meats that were cooked were also similar. There seems to be some commonality between them. It's not that they're uniform. But across the region, if you see a particular urban center and the rural areas nearby, they seem to share the ways of cooking and preparing food. If, so that is, I think, an interesting issue that, the, that between the urban centers and the rural areas surrounding it, then there's a very large rural area, urban centers are really very few if we look at the size of the area then the commonality of practice would show cultural similarities and that the urban and the rural civilizations were not that significantly different, at least when it came to food. But of course, as you said, they were meat eaters and they ate a variety of meat. And there are some issues which are interesting because we don't know what the answers are, that while the kind of bones we see around would indicate that they had domesticated cattle, and they were using cattle very, uh, in different ways. And it, it also seems to show that the, if we look at, the, again, the bones and other uh, 
evidence we have, that it did, did show that they seem to have used cattle for dairy as well. But when you come to the lipid residue, which is where the key evidence here is from the ceramics, and that's the key evidence here, it seems that we see much more prevalence of meat and not so much of the dairy products. Now that's a question. Why is it so? Is it because they have not been preserved? The what? The, the, the dairy vessels did not get preserved. They used something which just, just didn't have the longevity. We don't know. But so that's a question mark that the researchers have raised. Why it is so? And that while the bones of the animals during the digs show that cattle was used widely, and as we know, the, the uh, in the Indus Valley civilization had domesticated cattle independently as well. Uh, that this does not show up so much in the dairy records. That the, but the meat eating seems to have been of cattle as well as of pigs and other animals. So there is this wide number of animals they have eaten, but the, the dairy seems to be relatively less visible in the lipid residue. So that's a question mark that is left here at the end of it. But it does show that A, you can see civilizational practices which is something more than 4,000 years back. The period covered is roughly about 1,200 to 1,500 years. It's roughly the period they cover, which is, as I said, early, uh, mature, as well as a late Harappan. But in this, you have the decay of the urban civilization. So they really cover both sides of that. You see the continuity of it, but you also have this anomalies. And that's always interesting, because if you do break a historical problem, of what, what did the Prat people do and so on, you also get new problems. So that's how knowledge really develops. It's not closed, that because you have found an answer, therefore no new questions arise. So these new questions still now remain. But I think the interesting part is that we have now another instrument with which to analyze how the people there lived. And that's, that's always interesting to see a new tool come into the existence to analyze history. And this is something which is what modern science is bringing to the historical table, so to say, that you now have new instruments which you can use for finding a variety of things, one of which is incidentally the lipid residue, uh, an anal analysis of li lipid residue on ceramic ware. Yes, so can you tell us more about this tool that you're talking about, the mentioned lipid residues? And the study itself is titled Lipid Residues in a Ceramic Pottery in Indus Valley Civilization. So what essentially are these residues and why and how were they studied? This is a project with, between Cambridge and Banaras Hindu University, VHU. And they have been working for quite some time. It also has uh, MDU as a part of the project. So they have been working for almost now last 10 years. And while lipid residue is on ceramic ware is something they have worked, worked on for this project, they also had earlier, earlier papers on ceramic ware discoveries itself, what can they deduce from that, but also importantly, combining maps, where they took the Surveyor General of India's maps from British times, they took satellite imagery, and using all of this, they were able to locate very accurately where the Harappan settlements were and where they on Paleolithic channels, river channels, sometimes they were what would be called uh, nalas, which come up during uh, rainy season, and or where there were dispersed centers, which are not really on the uh, Paleolithic channels. And they came to conclusions that in different periods, the different settlements have come up in different ways. But they were able to map a large number of them, ending with the mature Harappan, where you can see the settlements on paleo channels. Now those were interesting because you could superimpose satellite imagery data, which actually shows you the paleo channels, the old ancient river channels, and you can see them from the topography, as well as also plotting them accurately with your basic GPS data and so on. So you can correlate all of this on the ground with the settlement data that you can go and search for the remains which you can 
which you know are there and locate them accurately and therefore you have the geospatial coordinates which can match with the satellite data. So this is interesting because it brings very different uh, kind of skills together. Normally people wouldn't think that in the archaeology paper you would find GitHub references of the software use. That's also here. So this, this is what interests me, that history actually was considered something. And of course, the historians will say history really means where text is here. But I'm looking at history as history and archaeology combined. And when you look at history in this way, then the tools of discovery today are not limited to the text or the artifacts that you find. But there are also many more things you can bring to the table. And of course, the analysis of the lipids residue on the ceramic ware is only one part of it. So all these other tools is what makes, I think, archaeology and history today far more interesting because you can bring your knowledge of very different things together and to get to do what is the question in history. What did we as human beings do in this period? And not what some kings and queens might have done, but what were the broad issues? What are the broad currents? How did they develop? How did they live? What were the technologies used? And currently, science and technology, the instruments of science and technology, are really providing additional information of a kind that would not have been possible, say, a few hundred years back or 50 years, 30 years back. So I think that is the really the power of bringing different disciplines together. And this has shown. So a question, an answer to a question which would have been very difficult to reply earlier, that where, what did the, our uh, ancestors or people who were in the Indus Valley civilization, I wouldn't call ancestors because who knows, we might have come from other parts of the world later, our ancestors. So we're not going to talk about that. But what did the people in this place, how did they live? A question that we can answer in more detail today than would have been possible say 10, 20 years back. And I think that's a, that's a very exciting way to do things, to know that the historian has access to tools that earlier would not have been thought of and we can answer questions of a kind. Do we see a significant you know, dis uh, disruption of the civilization post the Harappa urbanization ending? The answer is no, we see a continuity which means that it wasn't that people came from outside and disrupted the civilization completely, which is what we would expect if we saw a change in the way people lived and uh, the cultural practices changed. That didn't seem to happen here. So we also are able to answer the question that the urban decline of the Harappan civilization, that did not mean that the surrounding uh, rural areas that civilization completely got disrupted. That didn't happen. We also therefore think this is probably much more agroclimatic, that the surplus which was being extracted to sustain the cities, and there are about five or six cities in that period which were really large, that that was difficult to sustain. The surplus dropped because of the change of rainfall, which is what the supposition is, which is that saying that, which is the start of the Meghalayan era, started with a mega drought. And that's the reason that the surplus uh, would have been, become smaller. And that led to urban decays in many parts of the world, including uh, in the Indus Valley. So I think this gives us different kinds of answers than if we looked only at the textual or only at the archaeological remain, remains that we see in the places. And that, I think, is what is exciting about this as well. It's something which is rather mundane a lipid profile, and when you talk of lipid profile, we really thought, think of our blood triglycerides and uh, cholesterol. So this is really that from ceramic where we get the lipid profile and the lipid analysis, lipid residue analysis, we are talking about civilizations from that. That's a very interesting and an exciting journey, at least for the, maybe for the historians, but also for people who are like us who have an interest in this kind of issues for other reasons. And uh, finally, Prabhu, you can tell us what the results of the study mean for the notions of vegetarianism that really exist around the inhabitants of the Indus Valley civilization. Well, 
uh, that they were not vegetarians is very obvious. But uh, this is also an interesting issue because if you remember, uh, some time back in the National History Museum, what is the National Museum, sorry. If you remember, some time back in the National Museum, there was a Harappan culinary event. And they had given a menu which had contained a large number of dishes, which were from what they could reconstruct dishes with the Harappan people ate. And some of them were, of course, non vegetarian dishes, they were meat, fish, and so on. And the National Museum intervened and said, hey, we have a policy of no non vegetarian food on the National Museum premises. This was held at the London National Museum. And therefore, all those non vegetarian items were dropped. Now, you have either to, to do two things. Either you are thinking, you are doing an event which you want to recreate the culinary of the Harappan civilization, or you have to say, well, you know, National Museum policy of not serving non vegetarian food to people in events. That should take precedence. It's not even a rule, by the way. It's supposed to be a practice. Now, why such a practice should overrun history is, of course, a question I would leave to the viewers. But this is how our policies seem to be shaped. Because under, underlying all of this is a, what I call a very vegetarian, uh, upper caste, North Indian view of Hinduism, in which the upper caste Hindus believe that vegetarian, vegetarianism is the highest state of humankind. This is all other bhojans, all other food is tamasic and uh, rajasic. Maybe if you are king, you can have that. But it's certainly not the one which elevates humanity. And that requires the bhojan, which is vegetarian. Now, this kind of belief is what drives a lot of this, this kind of uh, historical reconstruction including the diet. And it's also interesting that the Harappan civilization has been the center of a debate. And what is the debate? That this is the, not, the, not something which is uh, distinct from what we see as a continuity, which is the Aryan civilization. And then, as you know, the Aryan civilization is what uh, a large number of the Hindutva votaries try to present to the people, not Hinduism. Because Hinduism, people who have we studied it have said various things, and historians have no have no bones there uh, about it. That Hindus, of course, ate beef, had uh, ate also uh, pork, and all of that. So the question of vegetarianism is not there in history, but it is there in the ideology of Hinduism, by which you say Hindus did not eat beef or should not eat beef. And all of this is, is uh, what I say, this reconstruction of history therefore becomes dangerous for them. And also the fact that you could say that, as we have discussed earlier, that it also shows that the distinct change that you see post Harappan civilization, and you see the coming of the horse, you see coming of uh, a nomadic population, which seemed to have come using the horse and conquered large parts of North India, starting with the Northwest. So all of this is an anathema because it's not for them the history they want. The history they want is rooted on the Hindu civilization because being entirely Sanskritic. No other center of civilization existed in India except what the Mahabharata and the Ramayana texts seem to show. Again, there are substrate over there, which we'll forget for the time being. And therefore, reconstructing all of that means the, that this, this kind of history should not be allowed to enter the history books. And this kind of history should not exhibit itself even in a, a culinary festival in the, in the, of, of the Harappan uh, food habits in the National Museum. So I think this is a part of the same battle. And when we talk about what the uh, Reich and others' papers, Narasimhan papers, what they show, that this seems to show that that approach of looking at actual history is much more interesting than trying to impose a schema on history. And that's sterile, doesn't produce new knowledge, 
controverts what we can find on the ground. But this, as I said, is not a historical issue for them. This is a political question. And the political question is connected to cow slaughter, banning of cow slaughter, attacking Muslims and others who might actually consume beef. So all of this is linked to current politics. It has nothing to do with the study of history, as the current research also shows. Thank you, Prabir, for joining us today. And uh, that's all the time we have. Keep watching News Click. Thank <laughs> you.